G'day you mob, how's it going? Welcome to this episode of Aussie English, the number one place for anyone and everyone wanting to learn Australian English, as well as get a big fair income dose of Aussie culture, history, news, current affairs, everything like that. Today I've got something a little different for you guys. I have the absolute pleasure and honour of chatting to polyglot Ollie Richards from storylearning.com. So, I've been following Ollie for quite a while now. He has an incredible YouTube channel, a podcast, as well as a website and blog that you guys can go and check out. But the main reason I've been following him is because he is a an avid language learner and he has spent probably the last 20 years or so learning many different languages. I think he's up to about eight or so now that he's uh, got under his belt, including things like French, Chinese, Japanese, um, Arabic, Portuguese, Spanish. There's a whole bunch. But he has a lot of insight into how to learn languages. So, anyway, I'm going to stop rabbiting on. I'm going to get to the content. Slap the bird. Get into it. I give you guys Ollie Richards. G'day, you mob. Welcome to this episode of Aussie English. Today, I have Ollie Richards with me. He speaks eight languages and is the founder of I Will Teach You a Language. You're a podcaster, a YouTuber. You also have a uh, new business called Story Learning that I, I'm looking forward to hearing about. But um, yeah, can you fill us in a bit about you um, before we get started and how you ended up speaking eight languages at the young age of, I assume, late 30s, early, early 40s? You're killing it. I, I am. Yeah, I am 40, although it doesn't. I've been, I've been told by a few people that I, I look younger than 40. I would never so have I'm guessed that. Take it. I would never have guessed that. I saw, <laughs> sorry to interrupt you. I'll let you get to your point. I was watching your Portuguese video the other day and you were like, oh yeah, I was just in Brazil learning for three years. Oh, it would have been 2001. And I was like, wait, what? You know, <laughs> no way. Yeah. I, I, I think it's the language and the, and the, and the traveling and teaching thing keeps you young, but uh, listen, I'll take it because you know, the alternative <laughs> doesn't bear thinking about, but yeah, so I, um, I'm from the UK. I grew up only speaking English and I, I suddenly found myself interested in languages when I was about 19 years old, I'd moved to London and I was just surrounded by people from different countries. So I just took a, a real interest in, in language learning and I learned French which was my first language, um, went to live in Paris for six months, uh, got quite good at French. And then after that, I, I thought, okay, I, I think I can learn more languages now because I've learned one language successfully. So I went on to learn Spanish, Portuguese, and then um, I, I had a kind of mid career, mid or mid, what was it like, end of my late twenties, I began teaching English, went to Japan to teach English. So I learned Japanese, and then I learned Cantonese and Arabic and a few others. Um, so I've kind of let the language learning follow my life. Really, I've always learned languages to for life reasons rather than for the language. Like I, yeah. I enjoy studying languages, but I, I don't do it for the sake of it. I learn languages because that's where my life leads me. And then I started uh, my a blog in 2013, which was called I Will Teach You a Language. As you said, it's now called Story Learning. It's the same, it's the same thing. We're rebranding everything to storylearning.com. Gotcha. Um, and because from that, what 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 I what I ended up doing was was uh, writing books of short stories to help you practice your languages and and then also developing courses so you can learn other languages through story and that kind of uh brings us to the present day where i'm releasing lots of just the other day we released um story-based courses in, in russian chinese and turkish which is fun We've got new books coming out all the time and i'm spending well, i'm spending most of my time actually on youtube um, yeah and you can find me on on youtube by searching ollie richards on youtube um because i've just what I've always really enjoyed is just making content about language learning because that's my real kind of passion. So I'm just having a great time doing that at the moment. Well, it's a bit of a rabbit hole too, right? You get onto YouTube and I think if you're just a layman or a consumer, you don't really understand what goes behind, goes on behind the scenes of actually having to think about thumbnails, thinking about, you know, the, oh, the story you want to tell. And it's just <laughs> so like- So much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's nuts. But Anyway, I, was, I had this full plan about all these, um, you know, standard things to chat to you about, I guess, about being a polyglot and everything. But I kind of threw that to the wayside after checking out your recent Portuguese video because you went through a lot of really interesting things there. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience learning Portuguese, just to give the listeners a bit of background of, of how that kind of went? Yeah, so the Portuguese was my third language. By that time, I spoke uh, French and Spanish. 
And then I was living in London and I got really into Brazilian music. So I'm, I'm a musician I'm studying music and uh, got really into Bossa Nova and had some Brazilian friends. And as anyone, as anyone knows, who's ever sort of discovered Brazilian culture, the day that you discover <laughs> Brazil, your world, your life changes a little bit. It's just a different, a different, a different way of living life. And I, I just, I loved it. So I, I started learning Portuguese by, by learning to sing Bossa Nova songs on the, uh, and whilst playing the guitar. So I learned the chords to play like all these, all these famous Bossa Nova songs. And I'd learned the lyrics in Portuguese, even though I didn't know what it meant. I had to memorize them. I'd wrote, memorize the lyrics like what one by one. And then um, after I'd learned like, you know, 10, 20, 30 of these songs, I started to understand how the language was working. So I started doing some language exchanges with some Brazilians in London. And then eventually I went to Brazil and then through friends of friends, I got introduced to some pretty big uh, pop stars in Brazil, people like Milton Nascimento, Betty Carvalho, Lenini, people like this. Started going to parties at their house, um, these incredible villas. And uh, just I, I just found myself living like this, this rock star life in Brazil. Um, while also, because I was really into music, while also going to the favelas and the samba schools and sort of hanging out at like... It is the most dangerous places, some of the most dangerous places on the planet, um, like just in the middle of all this amazing music. And so, so yeah, it was a really um, intense experience. What was it like for you? Because this is going to resonate with the listeners, and it's kind of why I wanted to get into this story. A lot of the people that listen to my podcast are obviously very interested in Australia and Australian English migrating here. They, they don't. They they tend to have an intermediate to advanced level in English already, but they really want to get into the culture and understand what it is to be Australian or to live here. And it seems like you kind of went through that same process of having kind of grappled with Portuguese back home, but then coming to uh, Brazil. And I think you were telling the story in the video that you had a lot of Paulista friends, right? I think you started in Sao Paulo, and yeah. you know you, you you built up that comfort zone. But then when you went to Rio it was like you'd been thrown in the deep end all of a sudden when you were on the street around, you know, people speaking with a different accent, the karaoke is there and everything. And I think that a lot of the listeners are going to resonate with that because something I hear all the time is I learned British English, I learned American English and I came to Australia and it was like a slap in the face. You know, I, I lost all my motivation. I, I was on the street and I thought, you know, I've got a good level in English, but I can only understand 20% of what people say, you know. So can you describe that kind of... Um, situation that you went through what it was like and then what you did to sort of overcome being in that situation to get used to the dialect and the slang and everything that would have been so different yeah so the basic the basic the way that i explain this now is that when i was learning portuguese in london with my friends who were mostly from sao paulo i was in a very protected environment you know they 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 lived in the in, in london so they knew that they were foreigners there and I was English guy learning Portuguese. So they, they took a lot of care to help me understand and very patient with me. It's exactly what you need to learn, but it's not a very um, realistic environment. So it, it's what everybody needs at the beginning when you're first learning a language, but, you, but you, it's not reality. So it was good because it got me started. But then when I went to Brazil, the first, the first time I went to Brazil, I was just with my friends all the time. So I didn't really get it. But then uh, later when I went back to actually live there, I was just on my own in Rio yeah. and I had to just, um, I was then just spending my time talking with people. These are not kind of the kind of educated middle upper class friends that I had in, uh, in, in London. These were like people on the street in Rio. Like it was, it, so it's a different kind of person, different kind of language. And I, yeah, I went from understanding 80% to understanding 20%. As soon as I landed in, in Rio, the accent's different. The slang is different. The way that you talk to people from different walks of life is different. Mm -hmm. And, and so it was a real shock, but you know, the, I, I could go through little tips and tricks and things that I did to, to help myself get used to it. But at the end of the day, what it really comes down to is just hours spent. Yeah. Just immersed in it. And so the way that I got around it was just by being there day after day, talking with people one after the other, um, hours spent immersed in Portuguese, and eventually you just get used to it. Um, and there's pretty much anything that you, any technique that you try and employ is blown out of the water <laughs> and, and made, or made pretty much irrelevant by just the quantity of time you spend immersing in the language. 
And so that's really how I did it. It was okay. It was just a case of spending lots of time there talking with people and being really keen to understand and to communicate. Do you think if you'd known that you were going to be in that situation, you would have had a way of preparing for that ahead of time, assuming that was today <sighs> and you had all the resources you've got, or is it the kind of thing that you just have to suck it up and deal with the uncomfortableness that those sorts of situations are going to bring when it happens? I mean, so much of language learning for me is just following life as it happens, right? So the reason that I was able to learn Portuguese quite well in the first place was because I had these friends. We were all young, had loads of time on our hands, had all these friends who would spend time with me. I spent time with them. Like, if I if I knew what was waiting for me, I could have done some, some things differently, but I probably wouldn't have done because just language learning for me is just such a natural thing. I, fo I, I follow what is going on in my life. Um, because back then, of course, we didn't have Netflix. We didn't have YouTube. And so, but if we did, then I think the two things I probably would have done would be, first of all, I would have gone out, probably spent more time going out to Brazilian clubs and things, trying to make friends with people from Rio, from those more kind of um, more sort of humble backgrounds, I think. And then second, I probably would have spent a lot of time watching Brazilian TV, yeah. documentaries, YouTube, things like that. Um, that's the advice I would give to myself. Would I have done it? Probably not. I was having a really good time, but that was all that mattered. That's the kind of the difficult part of it, right? It's like everyone's got a plan, but it's whether or not you can stick to it. And is it going to get in front of you just living your life and enjoying the process, right? I always have these huge plans with I'm going to work on Portuguese so much, but then I realize the things that I'm actually planning to do are not things that I inherently enjoy in and of themselves and that I wouldn't do outside of actually, you know, what I think studying is. I think you've spoken about this in quite a few videos. How important is it for language learners to follow the fun, you know, to, I think you mentioned in a video with Steve Kaufman, aligning yourself. You know, I think there are generally speaking, two kinds of people. There are people who can set goals, targets, come up with a plan and then stick to it religiously. And then there are people who don't. And of course there are people in between, but generally speaking, like you're either the kind of person who is you know, very driven, very kind of systems thinker, very motivated, very autonomous, and you'll do whatever it takes to achieve a goal. Um, but I'm personally not like that when it comes to things in my in my life. Like business wise, I'm very much like that. Like I'm very kind of meticulous and methodical, and I'll, and I'll do things according to a plan. But for most people, I think like language learning is not the be all and end all. We all want to speak perfect Portuguese or perfect Japanese or whatever, but I think most people really underestimate just how much work is involved yeah. in learning a language. It's, you know, the, the internet makes it out like you can learn a language in three months and you can, you can become conversationally capable in three months in a language. Define learn, really, right? Yeah. Yeah. If you really want to, right. But then, but then that's 1%. You know, you've still got 99% left to go and people don't appreciate just how much work is involved. I mean, it took, it, you know, for example, Portuguese was my third romance language. So I already knew what was going on pretty much. And I had three, four years of almost complete immersion in the language mm -hmm. and still I'm not I'm far from perfect, you know? Um, and so I think when, when you are in the situation that most people are in, which is like you're, you have half an hour a day to study an hour a day at most, you, you are not, that's not enough, basically. Let's be, let's be real. That's not enough to reach high levels of the language. You need to go through a period of years of intense immersion in the language. And so the, the point is, like, I don't think you really have a choice but to align it with your life and your values, because if you try and do anything else, you're just not going to keep it up. And that's why yeah. most people end up giving up languages, because it's just they, just, they just they confront the reality of just how much work it is. So for most people, I think the, the best strategy for language learning is do what you love follow your passion follow the people and and around you and the friends that you have um and work hard but 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 mostly try to enjoy it because that's the most realistic way of actually learning the language and also enjoying the journey which it's yeah. a cliche right it's the journey not the destination but it really is it really is people i think we have this this idea of 
we create in our minds this idea of when we are fluent, you know, when I'm fluent in English, I'll be able to get my dream job. But that day never arrives. It's, there is no destination. There is no point where someone hands you a certificate and says, job done. You're now fluent in English. That it's day a, never comes. It's a weird thing, isn't it? When you start, and sorry to interrupt you, you do have this kind of idea of fluency or proficiency, whatever you want to call it, as the, there'll be this moment where I feel at 100% ease, 100% comfort, like a native speaker with the language and everything will be easy. And I think like the Dunning-Kruger effect, the further you get up, you think, yeah, I've got this. And then you go down that massive dip and then it slowly you come out of the, you know, you slowly improve over time and you realize, oh my God, it's going to be uncomfortable forever. Like you just have to get used to the the lack of comfort and that it will diminish over time with continual work, right? Yeah. And then you put you, then you also realize, um, you know, you can do this for 10 years and then you can realize, wow, I've been doing this for 10 years now uh, and I'm still not perfect or fluent or whatever. But I've actually been completely fine this whole time. Yeah. I've got friends, I've maybe even married to someone that speaks the language. I've got a job in the language. I've been fine this whole time. So what was I worried about? And um, so, you know, I think the, 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 the more years go by and the more languages that I'm, I've, the more times I've experienced the language learning process, the more that I'm very, I'm very kind of, um, resistant to the idea of goals and aims in language learning because yeah i think yeah okay it can be helpful at the beginning just to kind of get the basics under your belt but for most people it's just you know you've got to live your life so it's that finding that balance is it and also making sure that there's just room in your life for that language building those sorts of habits and having it there constantly to work on but don't think you know I'll do three hours on Saturday and then I won't study for a week. It's more, don't make it a punishment. Enjoy the process and make sure that whatever you're doing, whether it's watching Netflix, reading books or studying grammar, that you just, it's, you're enjoying the journey and you're not focused solely on the destination. You have to do that. There is a balance though, because I think when people hear this, sometimes they think, well, you know, that all sounds fine. And I, uh, and I understand that I have to enjoy the journey, but I actually, yeah. I do actually want to learn. So can I have a bit of structure please? And a bit of rigor. And uh, so I think you do have to bring that as well. And, but the, I think the most effective way to focus your, uh, your time and attention and energy for discipline is in consistency. So yeah. rather than worrying too much about, oh, I have to do three hours every day or whatever, the single most powerful force in language learning is consistency. So if you just turn up and you do that hour every day, you don't, you never feel the progress from day to day, but if you keep it up and you do it for a year, you will most certainly feel that progress from one month to the next or one how do you, year to the next. How do you feel about streaks, whether it's in apps or tracking, you know, with a calendar in front of you crossing off every day? I feel like it's a double-edged blade where it works as motivation when you're starting out and you can see all the work you've done behind you in this unbroken chain, but then at any moment where it's broken, there's almost more incentive to just give up as opposed to, because you haven't built that kind of, I just need to be consistent. I can forgive myself for having failed here and there and leaving gaps in my you know, calendar that I'm checking off the days. I feel like at times when I've been using Duolingo, I'm good as long as the streak is never broken, but the moment life gets in the way and I can't do it for whatever reason for that day, after the fact, I'm just like, ah, well, it's out the window. You know, 365 days I had in a row, but now screw it. So what do you think of that kind of learning? Do you think it's a positive thing or a negative thing or it can be both? Or It can, be, it can definitely be both. I mean, there's no doubt that that kind of gamification does get people to work, but you're kind of talking, you're setting the bar very low, in my opinion. This is, I mean, these things like if you need an, a streak on an app to motivate yourself, there's something, there's something, something else is a problem there, you know? Yeah. So I, so I think you're kind of, you, we're, talk, we're in the, we're in the, in the territory of mind hacks and this, and this all kind of fits into a kind of picture of where we are with, where we are with society, which is like, how do we hack our way to, you know, this, this whole kind of Tim <laughs> Ferriss thing. How do we get 80% of the results with 20% of the effort? And it's like, mm -hmm. well, life is not just about shortcuts for Christ's sake. You know, like we, yeah. like it, I think for me, the meaningful, the meaningful life is one where everything that you do is aligned with, with yourself and you have, you only do things that you are intrinsically motivated to do and you take great pleasure in. And, um, and, and if you, if you find, if you take the time to think about what those activities are and you find those activities, 
you won't need streaks to motivate you because you'll be doing it. You'll be doing it by yourself. You won't be able, you won't be able to wait to to get back home from work and um, and and sit down to read that book, or whatever, because 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 you genuinely enjoy it. So anything can be helpful. Anything can work. Everybody's different. Um, but again, the the game really is won or lost by finding that internal why, that internal reason, and then sticking to that over the long term. I think you're right. I think you hit the nail on the head. And that was one of those things for me when I got comfortable enough to be non-consistent with every single day and focusing on long-term consistency. I think the results started to kind of take care of themselves a little more. And I just felt less stressed. I felt less guilty. I felt less bad about myself for not showing up every day and doing the exact same thing, you know? So yeah, it was one of those watershed moments for me where I was like, why am I doing this to myself? I need to be enjoying the process. This isn't, you know, it should be me ruling the thing, not the thing ruling me. Yeah, that, that's, that's exactly it. So you put a very, very large emphasis, if not all of your emphasis on learning languages through stories. Can you tell me a bit about how you came to that approach, how you sort of work that out and then why you think it's, it's so powerful to focus a lot of your attention, if not all of it, on learning a language through stories? Yeah, great question. So, so I think the main thing to say, and I'm trying to make a point of saying this more and more now, is that I'm not saying that this is the best way to learn a language or that you have to learn this way. What I try to do with, with story learning is to give the option and the pathway for people who want to learn in this way to study that way, right? So because there are a lot of people who don't get on with traditional learning who um, who don't like using, who kind of sit, sit there using apps and, and stuff and, and kind of deep down realize, man, I'm just wasting my time. Um, and uh, But they're, they're very attracted to to learning to more holistic ways of learning, like learning through stories, um, because they realize, well, hang on, I learned my, I learned to speak as a child with stories when my parents read me books. That's how I made sense of the world. So this kind of makes sense. Right? So there's a lot of people that that for whom this this really makes sense, and I see my job as kind of providing the material they and, and the programs they need in order to do that. So for me, like, so I've always learned my languages through input primarily and you can get input from lots of different ways you can be watching tv movies uh, it can be immersed with your friends so that you're just listening the whole time uh, it can be reading input is the foundation of language learning because yes speaking is important and yes you can learn to speak very quickly and say a bunch of things and impress people especially on youtube but <laughs> like we were talking about earlier the the the, the real volume of like body of stuff that you need to know to speak a language is um there's so much to learn. And the only way you can do that is through input. You can't learn all that stuff by talking. You've got to get the input so that you learn the stuff, right? And so um, the real power of, of, of input is, is that. And that's how I've always learned my language is through a combination of those things. Now, the thing about stories and how stories differ from, say, speaking with people or movies or whatever, is that with stories, you can be studying and reading pretty much any time you want. Speaking is great, super important, but you can't be doing that much of the time, realistically. You've got a life to live, right? You have to work. You've got a family, whatever. Well, to pause you quickly, I found too with speaking, you can't necessarily learn that much as you can from reading and listening. I, I feel like you can't pick up on as much that you're going to hear that's new content, right? Like I've lived with it's my wife efficient. now for four years. Yeah, exactly. And we speak at home, but I haven't noticed my speaking has increased just from speaking with her every day. But when I read... And when I listen to content, I find that my Portuguese picks up way faster than if I just yeah. put all my time into speaking. Sorry. You need, you need both, right? Exactly. You need, you need both. You, 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 you can't become fluent in a language without speaking. You have to speak a lot. But like you, and speaking is a great way for, for, for learning to interact with people, for learning the kind of day to day expressions and stuff like that. But again, this is like 10% of what you need to learn. Yeah. And this is most people are kind of, when they think about language learning, they're operating in this in this field of 10%. They don't know that that 90% exists because they've never got there. You only discover that 90% once you've got past the 10%, right? And so with, 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 with stories, and when I talk about stories, I'm, I mean, you know, reading books and then listening to the, to the audio narration of those books. You can do that anytime, on the train, in the car, in bed, on the toilet, in your lunch break at work. Like you can do, so it, it makes it a very effective and efficient way to study the language because you can do it uh, anytime. And so, um, you know, I, 
I first had my encounter with with stories. Uh, I tell the story about when I was traveling in Argentina and I was um, on top of a mountain in this place called Irusha, which is up on the border of, of Bolivia, very high up. And I got altitude sickness in the middle of the night uh, at like 3 a.m. and I couldn't breathe. Right. Uh, and I thought I was going to, I thought I was going to, I thought I was going to die because I literally could not get oxygen into my lungs. I was so high up. And so I remembered like jumping out of bed and walking out onto this balcony uh, outside, looking out, looking out over this, 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 this village and under a full moon, it was a really kind of haunting experience, not being able to breathe. <laughs> and, um, and I thought, man, this, yeah, this is, this is the end right now. I, I can't breathe. This is not going to end well. Um, Luckily, after a few minutes, I got my breath back. It was okay, but I was too scared to go back to bed. So I picked up this book in Spanish that I'd been that, that I'd, I'd bought and not opened. And because I, I was too scared to go back to bed, and we didn't have phones in those days, I sat reading this book all night, and I didn't understand a great deal. I could pretty much follow the plot, uh, but I just kept reading and reading and reading. And then the next day, as I was walking down the street, I re- I realized I had all these words popping into my head. Well, this is this is weird. What are all these words? I didn't know these words yesterday, and um, and I realised that these are words that had come from the story that I was reading the night yeah. before. So I thought, okay, well, hang on, I've kind of reached a plateau in my Spanish. I haven't been improving. But then just by spending a few hours reading this book, I've suddenly picked up all this new stuff. Maybe there's something to this. So I carried on reading the book over the next few weeks, and then I distinctly remember going back to Buenos Aires afterwards, meeting up with some people that I knew there, and my Spanish had improved so much. I could understand so much more. I could speak in, in more kind of eloquent sentences. And it was all because I just spent time surrounded by the language in the, in the form of a, of a story. And so I kind of thought to myself, well, how do I, this is because I wasn't teaching at the time, right? So I didn't really think that much of it, but, but when I went on to learn other languages afterwards, I used stories to help me there. And then when I started, um, uh, story learning, I, I started to think, well, how can I actually teach through stories? And that's when I started to write my books and I started to develop entire courses based on, on stories. That whole process took a long time, it took years, um, because I had to figure out how to do it in, in a way that the people liked. Um, but that's how it all happened. Yeah, it's, it's funny you say that because it's, it's one of those things I noticed too, just how much my language skills improved. And it was almost like I had a lot more words on the tip of my tongue after I spent a lot more time reading. And it seems to be this counterintuitive thing. If you think the more you speak, you're going to get better at speaking in terms of not just fluency or confidence and everything like that, but that you will be able to express yourself in more complicated ways by doing more and more and more speaking. But it's almost like you need to speak less and pay attention to time spent reading and and exposing yourself to vocabulary and grammar and all these things that you wouldn't necessarily come across anywhere near as often when speaking and then they just get closer for you to be able to pluck out of the air when you're having a conversation. You know, it, it is very weird. I remember having this conversation with my wife and I was using some, like I was reading Game of Thrones in Portuguese. And it's really funny mm. when, as a person who's not a native speaker, you don't know what common words are. Well, you don't know what really rare words are when you're first doing this. You don't know what words are kind of like, um, you know, a mighty steed was, was galloping down the road. You don't know that, oh, I can't just say steed to the average person when I mean horse. And so I was whipping out all these words and it was really funny because she was just like, you know, I understand what you mean. And then you end up having these conversations, but um, yeah, it, so this it was is, a very so this powerful is, this process. Is, this, yeah. And then what you're, what you're talking about there is, is basically a kind of negotiation between the two parties. Right. And, and sometimes yeah. people can experience this and they, and they feel, um, okay well reading the reading doesn't work because i'm learning words like steed whereas actually i need to learn exactly. the word horse so it doesn't work but actually no it's just giving you more options and then exactly. by 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 negotiating in the conversation you then that's how you figure out exactly what um what's the appropriate register to be speaking in and what exactly words fit in, in, exactly into, into, into that register it almost gets way fun right as a game where you're just like i'm just yeah. going to throw these words in because oh, yeah. i don't know and i want to see how they'll react and then if they don't do anything, you're like, okay, that's fine. But if then they're like, huh? And they give you that turn sort of dog look, you're like, okay, there's something to this. <laughs> yeah. You've got to be comfortable with being uncomfortable with, with, yeah. with language. Learning. Like, otherwise you just don't get anywhere. But I mean, I think a good, a good way to think about the speaking problem is that, you know, when you're speaking with someone, your primary concern is actually getting your point across. There's two things you want to do, right? Exactly. You want to be able to make yourself understood and you want to be able to understand what's coming back without looking like an idiot. Right. There's a lot of stake in a conversation. You've got to save face. You've got to maintain your 
your social status um within that conversation and not look like an idiot come across as a as an intelligent person and all of that means when that's happening in real time the to and fro of a conversation means it's very difficult for your brain to be open and receptive to new language and grammar patterns that might be there to be to be to be learned it's too much to happen mm-hmm. right so you need speaking but it's not an efficient uh, way to to learn new language Oh, I found that that my sort of anecdote is I've lived with my wife now for, I guess we're probably going on four years together. And initially we moved into a house in Canberra, which is the capital of Australia with, I think there were five Brazilians there. And that was, I've never been to Brazil, but that was how I learned Portuguese. I was kind of thrown in the deep end with her and, and all these other Brazilians. And my Portuguese pretty, pretty quickly got better than their English. And so it ended up this sort of positive feedback thing. But it was really funny. After we had our kids, I thought, you know, I'm just going to speak as much as possible at home and the rest will take care of itself. And I realized pretty quickly, crap, you know, my my Portuguese is actually plateauing. I I have the same conversation every day. You know, what do you want to have for lunch? What are the kids doing? Where's I'm going to go to the bathroom, blah, blah, blah. And you you don't realize that, okay, I'm getting hyper, almost native level at at this basic core, but the rest of the stuff out there, the other 90% isn't taking care of itself. And I find that's where Netflix and reading and spending as much time as possible, not just speaking, really helps fill in that sort of gap. Well, think of, think of it like this. Imagine a native speaker. So imagine an English-speaking um, kid growing up, right? Um, or imagine two. You've got two, two kids. You've got kid A and kid B. Kid A um, never reads, doesn't go to school, um, speaks every day with his friends and family. Uh, but has never read a book before. Uh, doesn't go to school, nothing. And then you've got Kid B, who goes to school, reads books, um, does his homework. Uh, who at the age of 18 is going to be the more articulate speaker? Yeah. I mean, it's like, it's like chalk, and, chalk and cheese. You've got someone who's going to be, um, yeah, going to be very, very great on the street, you know, in the sort of to and fro of real life. And then you've got someone who's educated, who can talk about lots of topics, has a much larger vocabulary has better grammar or all, all, all of that stuff. So it's, it's, it's hardly a surprise, really. The people, those who read become more intelligent. They become more, more, more articulate, all of that stuff. Um, and so if you, if you have the goal of becoming proficient in a foreign language, you know, why would you not, why would you not do that as well? I mean, I, you know, I, th- I think for most people, you want to be spending really 80% of your time at least in input to reading and listening of some kind, because that's the ratio that we, um, that we, we, you know, if you're at university or, or at school, you know, you spend most of, yeah, you have class discussions, but you spend most of your time reading, doing homework, all, all that stuff. What do you think, like switching gears now, what do you think in terms of the importance of learning about a language's culture it's, it's history, it's, you know, news and current affairs, the things that are going on in the street. I find at least that this is sort of my spiel with Aussie English. A lot of the time I spend mainly focused on those things through the medium of English, as opposed to actually teaching English, because that's kind of like, that's something that most students that come along have already. But the thing that's missing when I've interacted with a lot of my followers is that they want that They feel like that gap is missing between understanding Australia or understanding Great Britain or the US and the culture and everything. Do you find that that's a very important aspect to learning a language more so than just learning the words and the grammar? Is that something that you pursue as well? I think it's important to think what, to understand what we as native speakers actually think about and talk about. And so again, if we're assuming here that it depends what your aim is, right? If your aim is just to yeah. communicate and get by, then no, it's not that important really. But then let's imagine that you want to make your life in Australia. You want to have Australian friends, um, et cetera, et cetera. You need to learn the language. Okay. But then you need to learn the language for what? Well, imagine you go to a barbecue because I know that's what you guys do every day. Um, <laughs> like, and that's all we you're do. Surrounded, you're surrounded by, by Australians and they are all using the English language to communicate, right? But what are they communicating about? Yeah. Most likely, if you walked into um, an Australian barbecue today, you're going to be talking about things like um, COVID. Uh, you're going to be talking about the, uh, the, the, the restrictions on travel and movement around, which takes you into politics and uh, the government and your wonderful prime minister. Uh, you're going to be talking about immigration, maybe. 
there's going to be things like uh, forest fires and um, the state of the education system, uh, the price of fuel. That's a big thing here at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, this is what people talk about. It's what they care about, which means if you want, it's no good you turning up with all your fancy English words and phrases. If you don't know what to talk about or how to use them or the context in which they're being used, they're all for nothing. And um, so, so learning about the culture and current affairs, it, it is, I mean, that is the language because the language, let's, let's not forget, the language is not the end goal. The point of language is to communicate and to communicate with who? With other people. People in what? In your society. And so it's the affairs of the society that language is actually designed for. It's how you communicate with each other. And I think with language learners, you get this a lot in, in language learning communities. There's a big tendency to make it, you know, it's all about the language, yeah. the grammar, the vocabulary, the, the, the strategies. But no native speakers ever think about that. They spend literally in zero time thinking about any of that stuff. <laughs> you can't have a so conversation more, with us about that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I get I get that, you know, sometimes um, you know, when I when I talk to other people um here in the UK, people I meet, they're like, oh, so what do you do? And I'm like, oh well, I teach languages. <laughs> And they're like, oh, right, yeah, so like Duolingo and stuff, yeah? And you're like, yes, exactly that. And, <laughs> well, um, they were actually, I mean, to be honest, actually now I, I, I normally say, well, yeah, that kind of thing, yeah. Because I want to end the conversation as quickly <laughs> as possible. Out. Yeah, tap out. <laughs> because, because that's the extent of, that's all they know. And a lot of people don't even know, like, du Duolingo. But mm -hmm. if they know anything about language learning, it's probably Duolingo. Mm -hmm. um, or else their French high school class from, like, 50 years ago or something. And people have absolutely no awareness um, in general of the learning of a language or language learning as an activity or as a study. It literally plays zero part in anyone's consciousness um, for the most part, right? And yet for the learner, that's all they think about. You know, if you, if you, if you, if you, if you, uh, you know, come across someone learning English and you ask them how it's going, they'll probably spend 15 minutes telling you about their English classes and how hard they're studying and uh, how they they learned this this strange this this funny idiom the other day and and all these things that are that a regular person in society would just never ever talk about. So it's the culture isn't just important. It's it, the culture is everything if you want to actually um, really pursue the language. I was going to say you know I was going to say pursue the language to a high level, but it's not even that. It's a, it's not about the language. It's about the society. It's just to integrate, it's right? It's to belonging become, and being exactly. part of a society. Hmm. Have you have you found that difficult with languages that have uh, a lot of different, I guess, cultures, right? Like you speak Spanish as well as Arabic, and I imagine both of those. It's kind of like as someone who's learning those languages in Great Britain, and you're not necessarily planning to migrate to one of those countries. How do you then try hmm. and absorb as much of the culture as possible, or is it just a sort of shotgun approach of I'm just going to be interested in all the different cultures and compare them and have opinions on different topics and things about them so that I can chat to people yeah. about it. Well, so like I said, I mean, I don't take that approach to language learning because yeah. I always just, I, I learn what's in, what's in front of me with my life. So take Arabic. You mentioned Arabic. I mean, I don't really speak Arabic much anymore, to, to be honest with you, partly because, um, so I learned Arabic when I was living in Qatar and in Egypt. Uh, I was there for about three years in total. So I was learning Arabic while I was there. I moved back to the UK uh, six years ago and I haven't really spoken a word of Arabic since then because I just it's not, not part of my life anymore. Uh, I, I I really kind of follow by my circumstances in that way. But when I was learning Arabic in Egypt in particular, it it becomes it's very apparent in when you're in the country just how important it is. And I'll give you an example. Um, I was I remember getting a taxi back from work one day, and taxi drivers in Egypt are hilarious because they're either <laughs> They're either um, they'll, they'll just talk they'll just they'll talk to you the entire journey back, <laughs> and I spoke I spoke enough Arabic by then that they they would pick up on we could have a conversation, and one of the I remember one particular time where I got in, in a taxi and the guy was like um so what religion are you because in in that part of the world <laughs> your religion is a big deal right because most people in Egypt you're either Muslim or you're Christian mm -hmm. um for the, for the most part M most likely. I think it's probably like eighty percent Muslim, twenty percent Christian. If you if and, you were to um, say atheist, would they look at you sort of cross-eyed and like, what's that? Or would they have an understanding well, of? Oh, okay. You, so you you preempted my my story because <laughs> I, so I, I remember getting in the taxi, and um and the guy said to me, "So are you um are you Muslim?" It's like no. 
So are you Christian? Like, no. So what are you? And it's like, well, I, that's, I don't really believe in, in anything, you know? Um, <laughs> uh -oh. And then, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then the guy's like, well, so, so where did we all come from? It's like, well, I don't, I don't know. I, mean, I, I didn't know the word for evolution in, um, in, uh, in, in Arabic at the time. <laughs> and, and he says, so who, who made the universe? And I was like, well, I, I don't know. And if I, if I was more articulate, I would have said, well, I don't know. And I'm comfortable saying, I don't know, because it's, it's better than claiming something for which there's no, no evidence. Right. And um, not to take this off too much in a tangent, but, but, um, but the guy, I mean, he was, he wasn't having it. And he was like, well, how, how, how are we here? If, if there's, if there's no God, and so, I don't know. Well then, but you, how can you say you don't know? And, but this is, my point is that this is a very common conversation to happen in Egypt. And anyone who, who yeah. knows Arabic has lived in Egypt will have had this conversation many, many times because for them, I mean, religion, it is life. It's funny respect. because in our culture, it would be one of those things where it's like, don't, don't, you don't just, what's your religion? You know, you would be like, whoa, that is not something yeah. you bring up at dinner or ask strangers. <laughs> yeah. But for them, it's like, you know, the, 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 the typical scene uh, in, in, in Cairo is you're driving around at night and then you'll see, you'll have this cafe with people sitting outside and you, and you often see like groups of like tw 10, 10 men mm -hmm. sitting around. Cause there's always men that the women are always, well, not so much in Egypt, but usually societally, you got the men separated. So the, the men will all be sitting around with, with their friends. Like everyone um, is sipping an espresso and smoking a cigarette, everyone. And they're all, and if, if, if you turn down, if you press the mute button, you look at them and it, it looks like they're arguing with each other. They're all kind mm -hmm. of like shouting and their arms flying. It looks like a huge, like a fight's about to break out. <laughs> but actually they're just, they're just talking about politics and, um, and, and religion and stuff like that. That's, that's what they do. Uh, oh, that's just the way that they live their, they live their lives. So then coming back to the point, what is the point of learning Arabic? If you don't understand the things that drives these people, from the minute they wake up to the minute they go to sleep. What is the point? Literally, like, well, what is this? Like, so it's like some kind of computer coding exercise where you're looking to sort of tick boxes and make things work. I don't, you know, you can't mm -hmm. separate the, the language from the, from, from, the, from the culture. So um, you, know, you asked how I go about doing that. I mean, I, I do that when I'm learning a language by just being with people, by reading about the language um, and doing things as far as possible in the language living living as if i were living in the country uh, and exposing yourself to as many different things as possible um and i guess there's a bias towards content authentic content in the language rather than learner materials where um where it's all about the language yeah. you know i want to i want to i want to read about the about the society itself well, I think that's it. And that's a good point to sort of finish, but that's my take on it. It's kind of like the language learning stuff is secondary to the, the culture, the history, the stories, everything that makes learning the language kind of worthwhile. If you don't really understand all of these deeper things, then you're going to be great at the language, but you won't be able to hold a conversation with anyone. So anyway, Ollie, man, amazing chat. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Um, where can people go to find out more about you and what you do? Yeah, so you can go to storylearning.com um, where you can find, uh, we have uh, lots of free stuff there from blog articles to language guides. Uh, we also have courses where you can learn a bunch of languages. Uh, if you're on YouTube, you can search for Ollie Richards on YouTube. And if you're listening to this on a podcast, you can search for the I Will Teach You a Language podcast. Um, and then you can follow my um, dotted British English tones uh, there on the on, on the podcast so i look forward to seeing you uh over there brilliant thank you so much mate and i'm looking forward to having you on again in the future cheers yeah likewise thanks so much for the invitation it's been fun